Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm not used to a mic, so hopefully this will work. Um, I'm James Oliver. I'm the interim chair of the Department of Art. And on behalf of the Department of Art here at Pittsburgh State, um, let me welcome you to this celebration of Marjorie Schick's work as an artist and a teacher. Shortly, you're going to hear from her. But uh, before she speaks, let me give you a little bit of background on Marjorie's work and her teaching. Realize that nothing I can say here will actually encompass the amount of respect that we as a family of artists hold for Marjorie and her work. Uh, I'm sure that I'll omit a lot of important aspects of her career, but I apologize this, uh, for this in advance. The Smithsonian American Art Museum's Renwick Gallery website describes Marjorie's work as rooted in the European jewelry revolution of the 1960s when innovators rejecting the traditional materials, techniques, and social meanings of Western jewelry began to employ the entire human frame, not just a finger, the neck, or the wrist, as a point of artistic departure. These ideas are evidenced uh, within the works uh, in the University Gallery in Porter Hall, and I assume will be exhibited here in the lecture uh, when Marjorie speaks. The inclusion of her dowel stick works in the Gallery Raw in Amsterdam, the foremost gallery for avant-garde jewelry throughout the world in the 1980s, cemented her stature in the world of jewelry. In the year 2000, Marjorie was named American Craft Council to the American Craft Council College of Fellows. Uh, then with the publishing of her book, Sculpture to Wear, the Jewelry of Marjorie Schick, uh, in 2007, her stature was further crystallized in the world of jewelry. In addition to these specific points in her career, the list of works included in the collections of major museums is exhaustive, including major collections throughout the United States and the world. A list of those museums is included in the exhibit in Porter. Uh, if you're ever at any of those museums, you should look her work up. Uh, Marjorie has amassed this amazing list of accomplishments in the art world from her uh, second home, uh, sometimes probably her first home, Porter Hall, teaching for the past 50 years, which is an accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, her mentorship personifies all the attributes that we in the Department of Art uh, strive to embody within our students, to have the confidence in their work, to believe in and trust their decisions, by modeling her art making process and her tenacity to create avant-garde art for the body, she has impacted countless students beyond, uh, or both within the Department of Art and the university as a whole. And it is with confidence that I can say throughout her years of teaching, students and colleagues alike, alike sorry, have been afforded the opportunity to work with an artist of incredible stature. Um, students who have worked with her have stated uh, and I have a couple of quotes. Mrs. Schick's standards are the highest I've experienced in the education of art. She sets the bar high and leads by example in her own work and lifestyle. Uh, Mrs. Schick taught the elements and principles of design in solid, applicable ways and consistently expected and required high craftsmanship. She has been an, extremely, uh, an extreme source of inspiration and encouragement. Uh, she goes on to say, Marjorie Schick has had a life-changing effect on students and still holds the power of influence, encourage, encourage and inspire those around her. Uh, as a, and then a second student goes on to say, as my professor and mentor Marjorie Schick's approach to creating artwork for the body transformed my idea of what art and jewelry can be. She delivers a passion both in her career as a maker and through her instruction that is incomparable to any other professor I've ever had. She sent me a clear message through her teaching and taught me to appreciate what's around you and keep your eyes open, as your next inspiration might be right in front of you. <clears throat> she is humble and compassionate through her creative process and lifestyle that makes you hungry for more. Uh, please join me in welcoming Marjorie to the podium. And don't forget uh, a couple of quick announcements that we have a reception after uh, the lecture in Porter Hall. Uh, and if you have trouble getting over to Porter Hall, um, we have the uh, we have uh, transportation as well. So let me welcome with you Marjorie to the podium, and we'll.
really amazing. Um, and uh, I've been a little nervous about this, and even more so right now. What an audience you are. <laughs> so I thank you. My gosh, you come from, from near and far, mostly far, I think. So I thank you for coming. And I'm so pleased that you're introducing yourself. And, and uh, I'm thrilled to get to see all of you. Um, this is truly a celebration. And you know, there, some of you will remember, there's an old Garfunkel, Simon and Garfunkel album that starts, we seem to have filled the place. And holy <laughs> smokes, I think it happened. I never, ever expected it. So thank you. Um, all right, so I've got a lot of images to show. Oh, and I brought my, my purse, so I can <laughs> say it. <laughs> I hope it's the same time as that. <laughs> and you'll let me know if I go over. <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> I could ask that you. And so here we are. Oh, I have to look here. I have to see. So here we are, Jim and me. I mean, it's two of us. And we're pretty excited to think that we have served the university together combined a hundred years. <laughs> and so he wrote. <laughs> Thank you from both of us. It's, uh, it's been our pleasure and it's been, um, it's been wonderful. So this is what Jim wrote just the other day about um, how pleased we are to have made this record and this test of commitment, uh, eagerness to share our enthusiasm with all our students has been wonderful. So we are indeed um, fortunate to have had the opportunity to be here, that's for sure. Well, there's another way. Is, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, uh oh, I'm not standing there. <laughs> um, there's another way to look at 50-50, and that is I rather consider our careers here as being 50% or so towards teaching and the other towards academic, or in my case, being an artist. It's never really 50-50, and uh, anyway, so that I call it dual careers. So if we look at Jim, uh, he has had a, a terrific career here at PSU and has given the students and the university so much to be thankful for. Starting with, he used to lug that um, heavy, heavy computer from Radio Shack up to the third floor, <laughs> right, before there were elevators, and used it as a teaching tool. Not so much for research, but as a teaching tool and he designed all kinds of new simulations and other uh, kinds of things for the students to learn through that computer and later wrote the book, uh, Teaching History with a Computer, very important. And in addition, um, in the 70s, they had a course here taught by uh, three people, designed it from the history department called The Future is History. Perhaps one or two of you were in that class, fortunate enough to be in it because it took you through a, the whole, a lot of different kinds of histories. They had uh, people guest lecture on the history of biology, the history of math. Jim gave a lecture each semester on the history of rock and roll. <laughs> and so it covered pop culture, all sorts of history. It was a really dynamic class. In addition, um, he's been um, editor for over 31 years of Midwest Quarterly, never missed a deadline and also started his own journal, History Computer Review, which he had for 18 years with even an international distribution. So also he was the first one to teach uh, women's studies here at PSU as a readings class. So uh, he did incredible things, has a huge legacy. So uh, that's for Jim. And we have one son who's here with us from California, Hip Pip Foray. And it's Robert, and he works uh, for the city office, uh, city government office in Mission Viejo, a, a simply gorgeous spot in the world. And more recently, he's become the executive producer of their television sh uh, programming there. Now, when he went to college, he went off to New York. He went off to um, New York State at Binghamton, 
And he called, at, well, we saw him frequently, but not that frequently, but in his sophomore year, he let me know that he was choosing art history, can you believe it, as his, <laughs> as his, <laughs> as his major. Well, I had the same reaction. Wow, you can't be more diplomatic than that. <laughs> <laughs> and then flippantly said, but you know, you grew up since you were born going to art museums really often. <laughs> and his response was so much better than what I had said in that he indicated that it was the power of a teacher, right, who made him get so turned on to choose that as a major. The art historian he had there was in his last year of teaching before he retired. He had worked with the Monuments Men uh, saving art, I think during World War II, and he had also such passion for what he had spent his life doing that he was able to communicate that to his students. So I'll speak a, a little bit later about the power of a teacher, but certainly that was a good example. And my mother, um, my parents were divorced when I was a baby. And I was born in 1941, so that was a time when there were very few single parents out there. So she faced a lot of discrimination, but she had to earn a living for us. <laughs> and so she started teaching um, on a certificate um, in a two-room rural school. And then she moved up to a s larger town and taught there. Pretty soon she was in Decatur, teaching second grade, and moved up to junior high. And then she needed her, or wanted her master's. We moved, and so for four summers, she worked on a master's in Colorado, fell in love with Colorado, as everybody does. So we moved to Longmont. And uh, I put that magazine up there, cover, because that came out in 1955 while she was teaching um, high school there. And that whole magazine was devoted to contemporary jewelry. Well, I don't know. It could have had. <laughs> it probably did have an influence. But, you know, I was just uh, eighth grade, ninth grade maybe then. And I thought it was really strange stuff I was looking at. <laughs> and my mother made this pin of ebony and silver. And I thought it was also, uh, well, it went right along with what, what was happening in jewelry at that time. But I still have that magazine. And I think now, in looking back, uh, that was more than 50 years. It probably had a, a larger impact than I ever realized. And so I must thank Pitt State. I mean, it has been a privilege to be here at Pittsburgh State and to meet all of you and to have students for 50 years, each semester changing. And it's been very exciting. It's just been. Couldn't have been any better. And my colleagues. Now, I've loved my colleagues from the start on. For many years, I was the only woman in the department. And they treated me just fine. <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> it was great. Well, at Wisconsin, where I went to undergraduate school, I had a professor who called us all girl artists, right? And that the only two who were guys in the class were the only ones who would ever make it in, in art. So I, I, uh, I, ha I, I think I did all right with my male colleagues. I thought they were pretty fabulous. And I think they treated me with equal respect as well. So no more girl artists. <laughs> and you know, I didn't do all this work alone. Um, and uh, I worked really, really hard all these years and kind of deformed my thumbs and, and uh, wore out my poor old arms and hands. So it, at one point, I realized from what the doctor said that if I wanted to work when I'm the age I am now, I'd better be a little more careful. So I started hiring students and past students. And was that a blessing, let me tell you. Plus, we made that much more work. <laughs> so I, I can't list all of the assistants I had, but this is some of them. So I want you to know Janet Lewis. And Janet is now teaching jewelry here at PSU and is absolutely wonderful. And she has been from the first day I met her. And she did a legacy project at the Pittsburgh Library that most of you should maybe know about. 
And when they took the roof, the old copper roof off of the library, she's the one who uh, took that copper, which had this beautiful patina on it, and did these wonderful bas reliefs for the indoors and also the outside of the library. So if you haven't seen them, it's well worth driving by. And then David Ingram, who teaches high school in Erie, also has been a, a, a longtime assistant. And he had a show here at PSU just um, a couple of years ago. And you see his beautiful wood bowls and uh, his uh, ceramic ware. And he, he was interesting in that he would stack things together in ways I had never dreamed of. Whether we, whether we used this, that stacking in the final piece, at least it was eye-opening for me. This is Jared Webb. Jared walked in and took my class and wow, he was a wood tech major. I mean, just what I needed. <laughs> Not only that, he was creative, he could figure things out, great problem solver. So this is Jared. He worked for me for also a lot of years and was a model in my book. And uh, you see here, I'll talk more about this piece he's wearing later. And uh, it was tricky figuring out how to do those rings, so he did those. Kathleen a Alley, and Kathleen was a model in the book and an assistant, and she, I think she made all those knots in those two veils that are in the show. That was a lot of knotting, hard on hands. And uh, she was beautiful in both ways, both as a, a, somebody who was, was assisting and a friend. All of these were friends, and also as a model. In fact, others told me that when this photograph of her with my Snakes and Ladders piece was on, that she hated snakes so much it made her feel uneasy. But she never said a word to me. <laughs> <laughs> and Annie Pennington, who's here from Milwaukee, yes, Waukesha. And Annie was, a, was an assistant for at least four semesters. I knew that first day I saw her. She was the one to, to be here. And you see her wearing one of her pieces of felt and metal. She went on to get her MFA at the University of Illinois at Carbondale with her best friend who will be in the, best, in the next slide. And in the meantime, um, Annie and I tied these pieces together. And the one in the image that's closer to the picture of her, two of us sitting together, but it, you know, simultaneously put 30 hours of tying knots in that piece. So you know, you get to know somebody pretty well. <laughs> and she's worth knowing, let me tell you. <laughs> and her best friend Jillian, they became best friends here and then went off to um, uh, the same university, both for MFAs. And uh, Jillian is now head of the metals department at Southwest, uh, Southwest um, uh, University, well, I've got uh, art school, School of Art down in San Antonio. And we, wor they wor we worked three years off and on on a folding screen that's 15 feet long with, that holds just 20 bracelets. So anyway, she, I know that she worked on that. And my students, my gosh, my students, you've returned. I'm so thrilled. <laughs> and you all inspired me. You inspired me to, to work harder, both for you and in, in my artwork. And so um, I have some student work I want to show you. Look at this. Nicole uh, Meyer, the two bracelets of resin and silver. And Cora Hardy is here, and she had a mishap with her car. But she turned it into a gorgeous necklace, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm relieved because the title of the piece is Minor Mishap, right? <laughs> and these, I'm going to have to have a sip of water, but sh these all got in a book by Donna Malik. In fact, two books. One was just of contemporary jewelry, the Koosh Ball piece. And the teapots, there was a teapot book she did, and we had a number of student pieces in that. I think they're, I love them in their wildness, right? <laughs> and here's a Jillian bracelet on the left side of the screen, and a Janet Lewis necklace on the other side. Wonderful pieces in terms of textures and surfaces, all, all that there. 
and more. Cora Hardy's necklace, the six by six project where she's back to back herself. And uh, an, another Annie Pennington bracelet there called Autumn. And I had a fabulous student who is a percussionist. And, uh, but when he took jewelry, he didn't know he could be a chef, he could be a jeweler, or he could be a musician. Music won out, but that is a multi-talented person. <laughs> and then these, uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about the ramen piece. I love that. That was the girl's, she wasn't probably even an art student, and uh, that was the first jewelry piece, right? So I had assigned them to go home and make sketches of food that had lots of parts. Well, spaghetti and ramen went out, right? So I think she's got three layers or so, I don't remember exactly, of ramen noodles. They're cut of metal, soldered together. And then, my gosh, it had to have chopsticks. I mean, there was no way not to have that added. So that's a beginning piece. And then, um, Keegan Adams, the beautiful six by six bracelets, and two on the bottom, Annie's of uh, eggshell mosaic. And here's Kathleen again, a uh, beautiful model with her teapot piece. And you see that they're separate, it's divided up into separate brooches to wear. And the other of wood called Autumn. So I've had a lot of inspiration here. Now I want to give you all advice. Um, if you're about to retire, you don't have to listen like me. <laughs> but if you're, it, it's advice for everybody, however. I did a book called Sculpture to Wear. And it, for a lot of reasons, I mean more reasons than I can name, I couldn't have done that book without Jim. But one of the re reasons I want to speak about it is because when um, I had a birthday in 84, and for that birthday, he gave me the best gift ever, and it was this a Polaroid camera, a box that would hold, and a box that would hold a whole stack of blank five by eight cards. And he said, from now on, every time you make a new piece, you are to record that and put that in the box. So you record it with the image, and I'm not mechanical, so the Polaroid camera was perfect. Even when I put a piece in a box and didn't have the lid on it yet, I snapped its picture that way. And, uh, I put the date, the name of the piece, the sizes, and then when I was good, I kept track of how many shows or publications the work was in. So in the book, there are 475 pieces. I should have gone to 500, I had that many, but 475 was enough. But I could not, you cannot simply remember 475 pieces with all that information unless you keep records. So I'm suggesting that all of you from now on keep good records. And here's the top, the, the cover and the back cover from the book. And Jim and I went to Stuttgart at the very end. Um, to He proofread all the copy, and I was um, there to proof all of the color separations. And the um, graphic designer showed us five different versions that we could, I could choose from for the, for the cover. And I immediately chose this one because I always liked having Gary Pohlmiller, who's here from, from Parsons, hooray, my photographer. I always liked to fo have those images, my pieces photographed from the back because the back of the mannequin is more neutral than the front. And we've got the back of the piece on the front of the book and we've got the front of the piece called grass on the back. And that's <laughs> my best, the best part of all. So <laughs> that's my advice. All right, so how did all this happen? I love this. I just thought of how to do this this morning. That's the guy. <laughs> yeah, I've got that. No. Yeah, I've got that right. Yeah, we met at Wisconsin. We dated, and we were planning to be married at the end of uh, school and senior year. Uh, he was getting his master's then, too. He said he was going to apply for a PhD program. Pardon me. <laughs> And for some dumb reason, I said, well, if you're going on for an advanced degree, so am I. Can you believe that? I think it was pretty arrogant, a little, a little sassy, <laughs> but it's what I thought. And so um, we, he decided that because his father taught English at Purdue and his mother worked there as 
an editor of thermophysical properties books, we could get in-state tuition in Indiana. So he said, let's apply at Indiana. Well, he probably was in instantly, I would think, I would hope so. But me, I didn't even know how to fill out the application. And I'm, I'm not joking about this. The first question I could not answer was, which degree do you want? <laughs> and one had only two letters of the alphabet. MFA was a new degree. I didn't know anything about it, but I knew it took three years, and pardon me, 60 credit hours. I put the check mark by that because there were three letters of the alphabet and not just two. <laughs> so that meant, that meant it had to be better. And then the next, <laughs> the next thing I couldn't answer was, what was I going to study? Well, who else do I ask once again but Jim? And uh, <laughs> I said, I don't know how to answer that because I like painting, I like sculpture. Maybe ceramics, possibly, I don't know. But he, being the smart man he is, he said he thought I liked jewelry better than all my other classes. So this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and just by the luck of it, I stepped into the most amazing program with the most amazing teacher ever. Oh, but I have, to, this is more. This is the best part. <laughs> my letter of, my, and it's so true. My letter of acceptance read this way. You know, you're, I, now I, 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 my papers now, I'm working to get to the Smithsonian because they've been requested for the Archives of American Art. Can't find this letter, but I still, it's indelibly in my mind. <laughs> and if I ever find it, I'm going to send it. <laughs> so it's so true, though. Now, Jim had taken my images, my slides at that time to get in, and they did accept me, thank goodness. But then they added, as you see, six more hours under my degree. And welcome. <laughs> But it was the best thing ever, because look at how dull this piece is. This is my, one of my early jewelry pieces from 1961. Now you compare this one with that chopstick piece. That was a first piece. And there's a big difference between those two, I think. And so <laughs> I, I deserved every word of that letter. <laughs> and then by 65, at Indiana University with this remarkable teacher. I was doing um, texturing metal to make it look like marks on a paper, uh, to, to, to be like drawing marks, but now in metal. I was no longer afraid of soldering, so I soldered like crazy. I could hammer the edges and thicken them and do all those processes, but more importantly, I was approaching the work now in a three-dimensional manner which was a lot more interesting than what I started with. And by the end of my program in 66, I was able to consider a necklace as something that goes completely around the neck and uh, approached it in that way. So it was the power of a teacher that found in me this monstrous passion to make things, but in a three-dimensional way, which was her, her, her way of doing it. And her name is Professor Alma Eicherman. And um, she's wearing a piece. Actually, we had her here as guest artist years ago, and so that's my old classroom. White it, yay. <laughs> so anyway, 20th century jewelry is an art of open, continuous forms in space. Its aesthetic body is the relationship of solids and voids which define each other. Now, how did she get this monster out, so out of me um, to create all the things I've done? Um, she taught aesthetics, and that's probably the hardest thing. To teach create, you know, you really can't even teach creativity. But those two things are the hardest to uh, do, but she managed it. Well, yeah, we had drawing. Uh, she would stand for three hours every Monday night critiquing our drawings, and we did not dare not show up with our assignments. <laughs> and she made certain we had to know, it, we didn't know just about jewelry. She wanted us to know about painting and sculpture and everything. Above all, she wanted us to work. I mean, we had a little drawer in each of our benches, and we had to keep a record of how many hours we spent in the studio. 
And she would check that. I mean, it was no lock on it. She would check that all the time. Also, she loved concerts because she had a uh, part music degree originally. And she would come in after a concert, all dressed up in the evening. IU is a fabulous music department. And she would see if we needed help, greet us. And when she left that building, there was a guard at the door. And that guard <laughs> kept a notebook of when we would leave every night or come. <laughs> and we knew, we knew that she was coming to see us, but she was checking that notebook for sure. <laughs> and Jim always says that one of the smart things she did was for me to know when to sort of step back and give me my independence. Now, um, I think the most important piece was the smallest one I made while at IU. It's maybe an inch high and two inches wide. But in it, I put these iron wires and I s pushed them out in space. Well, it made me giggle. I thought, what the heck have I done here? Is this some big mistake? But she liked it, and I liked it. And that tiny thing gave me the nerve to then begin to branch out and extend into the other space, outer space, uh, not outer space, but the space <laughs> around, <laughs> around the figure. <laughs> We both taught one year at KU, right out of school, and that was also an important year for me because as I made the rounds of my students, I looked in a, in a toolbox, and this girl had a, had a little medicine vial. She painted purple. So I said, how did you make that purple? I mean, this is, sounds stupid, doesn't it? And she said acrylic paint. Well, they were new then. I had only used oils. As soon as class was over, I marched to the bookstore and bought my first set of <laughs> acrylic paints. And I, I think it was meant to be somehow. Also, there was an incredible dress shop there in Lawrence. <laughs> That's the rest of the story. And I wanted earrings to match my new tiger print dress. And these were so big and heavy, I wore monofilament over my head to support them. But, but they were the start of it. And then um, I just kept going. Uh oh, I've talked too long. Oh, I've got the wrong one. I just <laughs> that could be too. <laughs> I just kept going with more paper mache. So uh, at the end of that year, I did a series of six armlets. You see them here, bracelets. Here they are. And Jim <laughs> had research to do in New York, so we stopped to see Miss Eicherman on the way. She was a straight metals person. But I took her to see these bracelets. Now, Miss Eicherman told me to do two things in New York, and I always did what Miss Eicherman told me to do. <laughs> she was fabulous. Well, anyway, she said, you go to the Museum of Modern Art, and you meet with a curator. She gave me her name, because they'd had a recent jewelry show. I had never been so nervous in my life. You can imagine that. But I did it. And it, you know, she, the woman was very polite, and that was enough. And she said, you must make an appointment and go to the American Craft Museum. I got there, and I got only some of the bracelets out of my bag. And Paul Smith, the director of the museum, grabbed two, and he was up out of his chair and into another room. Well, with a mind like mine, I thought I had done something very wrong. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, why did I even come? This is just turning into a disaster. He walked back in and he said, we're having this enormous made with paper show and we'll travel in the US. It will be at the Hemisphere in Mexico. I need these two bracelets for the show. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And then <laughs> after that, he added, and that was the most important part. He said, keep me posted of what else you're doing. I thought, really? <laughs> I did a little, not as much as I should have. But that was a really wonderful sort of um, uh, thing to happen. It gave me the courage to keep going. Now, I like this quote, the guitar chose me by a famous guitarist. And I kind of think paper mache chose me. <laughs> so I kept going with the things getting bigger and bigger. These were all done here in Pittsburgh, the helmet mask. Bracelets were no longer bracelets. They became armlets and big shoulder sculptures. But I kept up with my medal. This is a necklace inspired by that Van Gogh painting. And what he did in that, he took his brush and he made separate strokes that became a whole shape. 
So that was my idea, not to look like wheat, which I don't even know yet what it looks like, but in a field at a distance. But um, the, the, the massed lines that I made start at the center front and end at the center back. But every time we'd have a faculty show, I would say, now these metal pieces here are my really important ones. And the paper mache and others just because I have to do them. So here are some more metal pieces from the late 60s, early 70s. The blue eyes piece is enormous. It was a brass necklace that just laid on the desk and it was so boring. I thought, oh my gosh, what can I do? And I thought, I've never looked through my necklace. <laughs> so I made binoculars, you know, out the front. And then that caused a balance problem. You know, it was going to fall forward. So then I had to go down the back to my waist and then up behind, way behind. So this is Blue Eyes. It's in the Nelson now. Nelson. <laughs> and that was using lines in space. But in the other image, you see I was not hesitant about putting lines on a surface. So that's an armlet. Now in the show, which some of you have seen and maybe some of you haven't, I didn't think about the importance of this piece. But it really is a good one to have put right where we did. Because Jim, knowing my work and that I'd only been doing planes and paper mache, he said, can you do linear paper mache? And I said, sure. I didn't know, but I went to the Salvation Army and I bought old steel coat hangers and I cut the heads off and I straightened them with a hammer on the anvil. <laughs> I learned from my students later I could go buy new rods, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I made my rods. And so this is all silver soldered together from those rods and then wrapped in paper mache. So I think that when I later, uh, a lot later, did the dowel stick pieces, they were an outgrowth of that type of piece. But as is normal, I make them bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really a huge one. I call it the cage. And as I remember, I was invited to a jewelry show in Georgia. Maybe a friend um, was having it. And I probably ship this in a washing machine box <laughs> for the jewelry show. And I, I heard, I, the person who told me was very polite, but I think they were kind of shocked and horrified <laughs> <laughs> that Schick was sending this enormous piece. So I just want to emphasize that what I've done was not always in the realm of what was being done. It was sort of pretty much outside of that because of its size, its materials, and such. And um, for the university, we had to keep records year after year. And I know one year, I was rejected from eight shows I applied for. Now, that's a lot of shows. I got in three, but I was rejected from eight. But the three gave me enough you know, to keep going. And even if I had been rejected from all 11, I would have kept going anyway. Uh, so this is pretty, a pretty nice quote, I think, and um, I wanted to, to uh, put it in because it uses the word, once again, patina, <laughs> which I use throughout this. And the stories, I, I can't tell you all the stories, but most every piece has a story. Um, you would know that. So this is in the show. All because Rob, our son, said, Mom, you've got to put that piece in. I said, I can't. It's all falling apart. I can't do it. And the reason it fell apart, and it's old too, but I, I'm still together, <laughs> I haven't fallen apart. So H, H had something to do with it though because it's made of newspaper, and newspaper does not keep. So um, Jim took this picture of me. I felt like I was an elephant with 32 tusks, uh, trunks, I mean, and uh, that was it. I never ever imagined that spinning in space, which it, you can, I mean, it took me a year to make it. You'd think I would have thought about those other things, but didn't. So there was a friend from Kansas City, Marianne Bransby, who taught at UMKC, and she put together this amazing performance of UMKC dancers who performed with her work and my work. And so this piece was performed with. Now, I, here it is. It, we did it here, at P, here in Pittsburgh. We did it. At the, at the Kansas City Art Institute. We did it at the Bronx Museum in New York. I mean, there were rehearsals, and we went a lot of places with this. And so that piece simply wore out. <laughs> now, I loved it when those tubes would fly off during the performance. And then it, I loved it that it would fill up the space. 
But then I think, darn, I've got to repair that when we get home. <laughs> so anyway, as you can see in the show, it's got a good long patina, and it uh, needs a lot of repair. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Rona's good idea to make it look like it's been spinning. <laughs> and uh, the other materials, this first group of slides about my own work has to do with materials. I love this quote because sometimes the material does just take over. Like when I went to Bolas one day and in the janitorial supply they had these great green mops. I mean they were gorgeous, these wires, not wires, but these lines coming up. So I bought a couple, brought them back, took them all apart and I was teaching weaving. I was originally hired to teach weaving and crafts, and then Mr. Keeney gave me jewelry. But um, so the uh, piece developed in that way from seeing that m those mops, and then I did one in beige. And I don't have images of the one that's in the show, but the one in the show was made specifically for those dance performances because I wanted a piece that would bounce, right? <laughs> and it's string and foam rubber, cut on the bandsaw and dyed. All right, so, and then about 82, I discovered dowel sticks. Man, that really changed my life because um, those dowel stick pieces really uh, brought me a lot of attention from Europe and then from the United States. But here you see a piece that today is at the Renwick at the Smithsonian, but I cut it down. I'm so, I, when I, you don't tell anybody this, but, but when I made that piece, I was so thrilled because in Pittsburgh, I could get four foot dowels. I mean, I lived with three foot ones for a long time, and when four foot ones came to town, it was a cause to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, UPS has a size limit, and I obviously was way over it. I mean, I cut the piece down, and I still had to have it trucked to Philadelphia first, and then I'll. So I think, why did I bother? I wish I, I always wish I'd left it longer, bigger. And for each piece, I normally set myself a challenge, like here, to use all these sticks to develop a plane. Um, if you're conservative, you wear it vertically, otherwise it goes horizontally. <laughs> it's 36 inches across. And then you see I was developing a need for planes again, not just lines. So this happened. <laughs> the dowels are still there. Also, I was beginning to experiment with the application of the paint more. And then uh, I was uh, artist in residence at Middlesex Polytechnic, I guess about 1990 in London. I loved it. I took all my wood stuff every day. I carried my tools and my wood on this tube to go out there. And I didn't notice what their spring break was. My gosh, it was a month long, mm -hmm. a month spring break. I thought, I, I can't work. I can't go out there to do my wood. So I thought, what can I do in our flat? I mean, I wasn't going to hammer and saw in our flat. And so I returned to paper mache. So in doing, in doing that, this piece is now in the Hermitage, um, I started building more complex forms and painted it in more complex ways. And then, I don't remember the date on this, but you know, what do painters paint on? They paint on canvas, and a lot of my work is about the painting. So um, this is La Palma, it looks like that. I drew the palm trees in the backyard. And, uh, and this is wood and, and canvas. So, once again, how did all this great stuff happen? I don't know that that was great, but how did it all happen? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to say it that way. <laughs> but how did I get a show at that fabulous gallery raw in Amsterdam? Well, partly it happened because I took students on a field trip from here to KU, <laughs> and on the bulletin board at KU, not here, but up there, was a notice about a show called Jewelry Redefined which was for all alternative met, uh, materials. And I had just started doing dowels and paper and thread. And so, um, yeah, uh, I, it was such a small box, I, I still remember packing it on my kitchen table, which can no longer happen, but <laughs> it happened then. So that summer, I didn't even know if I was in the show or out, I get this packet from Amsterdam and Jim brings it up to school because I could hardly wait to see what it was. 
and it was from the owner of Gallery Raw, who was a one of the judges of that show. And he said, I'd like to see more of these pieces. I didn't have any more. He'd seen half of all these new pieces. I had only a few others. But it looked like a great thing to me, what all he sent me about the gallery. And I'm sure it was Jim's idea. I wrote back and said, well, in six, I don't have slides right now. Well, sure, I didn't even have the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but, in six, but in six weeks, I'll send you slides. So I worked like a dog. In six weeks, he got the slides. He wrote back. And bingo, he wanted pieces for his gallery. I mean, I, it was what, I remember giving a soldering demonstration thinking, there's somebody in Amsterdam walking around with one of my pieces on. <laughs> See, the two are intertwined. So this is the look of that poster. Now, one more thing, and I've got to stop telling stories and hurry through this, because my purse is telling me it's getting close. <laughs> but you're all friends. Maybe you'll stay. Um, um, it, well, I, can, I can't remember, I lost my track. So here's the gallery. There's some reflecting yellow car on, on the big necklace, but that's it. And the greatest part was walking around Amsterdam and seeing my name on that poster in great spots. So that was quite wonderful, and, and, and that was how it worked. Now Paul, when I tell him, the owner of the, and I tell, have told him that story several times, he always says, how did you have the confidence to think they'd be any good in six weeks? So I don't know. I don't know about that one. But And here's for the second show. I eventually had four shows there with him. I'm no longer part of that, but it was great for third. Oh, and the one I'm wearing. Yeah. For all his celebration shows, for how many years he'd been in business, he would invite us to have the show, and he'd always give us a theme. This was for being in business for 35 years. So there are 35 sections here, and he wanted an addition of six. So when you go to the show, you're going to see the other five and the sketches. I never do sketches, or rarely do sketches as I, uh, be, as I work. But I had to, to make six just alike. <laughs> and they're reversible. It's brighter on the other side. So, uh, oh, this is my favorite quote. Don't you like that? <laughs> I love, I love it. And why, you know, can't you think, can, you know why I would like that quote. And that's because it says to us that you need to have a commitment to what you wear. <laughs> and if you wear my work, you are, you are making that commitment. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, this is part of it. Uh, I think I've, um, I'm going to go back to that one. I got those slightly out of order, sorry. But a couple of years ago, I was invited to lecture uh, for a seminar at Yale, jewelry seminar, uh, at the art museum there. And Jim always has better ideas for titles. My titles are really dull. So if you see a good title in my book or on a piece, you know he, he made that title. <laughs> anyway, for that talk I was going to give, he titled it, Jewelry is Sculpture. Wearing David Smith. Well, I got to Yale. They were testing out my PowerPoint, and the woman said, "You know, we had at least one phone call from somebody in town saying you can't wear a David Smith. <laughs> Why? What is this strange title?" So I'll, I'll see if I can go back to the image that was to be next. This is what happened at the end of my graduate study. There was a magazine when I was studying for my oral, devoted almost entirely to the work of American sculptor David Smith. And uh, when I looked at that work, and I love it, I thought how exciting it would be to be able to put my head through a hole, wrap my arm around it, and at that second, I knew my future would be making sculptures to wear. And the huge necklace on the right, in 94, um, the, there were Winter Olympics in Norway, you might remember some of the scandal that happened with the ice skaters. Um, but with every Olympics, a certain amount of the funding must be spent on cultural events. So I was one of about seven artists, I think, who were part of a jewelry workshop. I mean, they had ceramic workshops with Peter Volkus and all kinds of others, but I was part of the jewelry one. 
and we were just outside of Hamar, where the ice skating was. And uh, this was before the Olympics happened, though. And if I got, we worked long hours. We'd stay working every evening till 10, and we had lectures to give, lectures to listen to, plus make pieces for the final show. And it was all a 10 year, a 10 day event. But if I needed a break or more supplies, I'd walk into Hamar and I'd buy, I used to buy colored plastic clothespins <laughs> because I've always hung our sheets out on the line to dry. And colored ones were a lot better to use than plain. <laughs> so I thought, well, I was for a while trying to do things pieces that related to my life. So it's kind of a small event, but a nice one. So this is my um, ode to clothespins piece. Largest necklace I've ever made, and now you know why we always have a station wagon. So I <laughs> get my necklaces to UPS. And so it's sculptural, right? It's sculpture to wear. These are, are a couple from a group of pieces I did that we're going to go to a show in Europe. There were five of them, the four here. And that was always pricey to ship abroad. So I was able to ship three, uh, five in three boxes because they, f they fold. And what's interesting about these necklaces is how you can wear them with your arm as well as your head through part of it. When they're on the tabletop, you can turn them almost like pages of a book and set up new relationships as you flip the, I'll call them leaves. And when they're open and on a wall, they're like gigantic gyroscopes. So those are indeed sculptural. And this is also, and there's something about this that I like and want to emphasize, and that is that when the piece is off, you have no idea that it's wearable. And I kind of like that so that you see the, uh, it first as an object and appreciate the aesthetics of the piece before you know that, ah, oh, I can wear that too. Yeah, I want you to know that, and it certainly is wearable, but I prefer that you see it the other way first. So challenges, what will I do? Well, you know it's big. And uh, so, so here's a big one, and I don't think I'm rebellious, but the American Craft Museum had just moved into a new building, and when I visited it, that jewelry room was about this big. Now, <laughs> now it's supposed to be big, is, uh, bigger than that, I thought, but jewelry, you know, jewelry is normally small. So when I was invited to the next show they were having, I tried to make it too big for the room. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, uh, I don't know, they, they have it and they've used it. And this one, obviously, Jim gave the title to, which is spiraling over the line, because um, is it jewelry? Is it? fashion? Is it clothing? Is it sculpture? Is it all of those things? It's hard to put a definite title on exactly what it is. So I like working in that uh, over beyond the boundaries kind of thing. Painting and color, you know, I never know what I'm doing when I put the paint on. And so many of these pieces have a lot of layers, and I remember this one. I took to Professor Alex Barty, who's here, yay. I used to go to him when I'd have problems with my pieces, not with the construction, but with the painting. And I remember saying, Alex, this is so ugly. I mean, it was the first time I was using toned down colors. And he said, what is ugliness? How do you define that? He always asked me good questions, right? And this one, I don't talk about time, but probably 65 hours painting it. And I had taken a, a, a summer print uh, class at Cal State Fullerton because I never got in the printmaking classes at Wisconsin. They were always full. So I thought, I need printmaking. Well, I know I'm not going to be a printmaker, but I liked the class anyway. And there was a, a woman in the class who turned in at the end a, a print that was all black. But she had printed it so many times that, what, that a little bit of the, the other time showed through that black along with some of the edges of the print, of the ink. And so I thought, you know, I should let some of my other layers show through. So that's what happens in this particular armlet. And now, you know, it's crazy. Uh, this is at the back of a piece. 
And, you know, what does it take? One second to flip it over? Man, to me, that's like hours because <laughs> the distance between the front and the back, to me, seems miles long. It's so crazy. I, uh, but anyway, you can tell that it's all in the same piece, but I have to work at that one. Illusions I like to do in my work, and this was one of the first ones where I was building it three-dimensionally, but painting it as if it looked three-dimensional in other areas. The dowels were still there, but used in a whole new way. And this one, some of the cubes are really there, some are just painted on. And then I thought I'd be smart, and I'd try to paint some of them out, painted them gray. And here's another one. Um, David cut parts of his oak tree for me, but then he built the uh, new uh, limbs, and uh, it's my um, Four Seasons series. But somebody bought summer or spring or something. You can't just have three seasons. <laughs> <laughs> so windows as subject. Uh, I probably ought to rename this one. It's called Yemen windows. And right now that's not so good, but we used to take Sunday New York Times, and in the travel section was this photo, so gorgeous, of a palace made of mud and painted in Yemen. And so here, oh, here's my uh, piece and a detail of it, um, a body piece, canvas and wood and cord. And then uh, I think I already mentioned that every Saturday I would go to art classes in Chicago at the Chicago Art Institute and ride the subway and, and go past these buildings like this. I always love looking at skyscrapers because the outside is all the same and contains all those windows that are all individual. So here's my Chicago windows piece, which is also wearable. And uh, now uh, I'm trying to speed up. Am I too fast or too slow? What? Fine, Fine. okay. Oh, you'd say perfect anyway. <laughs> I think you would. You're so kind. <laughs> so presentation, I can't seem to stop with just the thing. These were, I thought, kind of, kind of needed more. <laughs> so this was the first time I did a painting. That does not have the necklaces on it, but they go on it, and they're reversible. The necklaces, of course, are painted on both sides. So I, it took me six weeks to paint this, but... Uh, you can lay them on either way, and I don't know how to do the clicker, so you'll just have to look hard at that. <laughs> and then this piece just went to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and you see here um, on the left, it's the, the wall piece that will hold two necklaces, one of which is on it. It's the seed pod necklace that's on it. <coughs> on the right, you see two ne both necklaces on the, on the form. And uh, there you see the two necklaces. They're both wearable. And you could wear both together at the same time. Well, you could. <laughs> and this is at the Spencer. And uh, it's a sizable spiral brooch. And I did a painting to support it. And you can barely see where the brooch is on that. But I tried to make the image uh, on the mannequin the same size as the other size. So this is the pin stem here just sticking out. Well, you can't see that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and this one is in that Emprise Bank um, collection, Mike Michaelis and Wichita is putting together. He first has had the necklace, and I thought, it's got to have a painting under it. So that is the support for it when it's not on. And this one, the necklace is sort of camouflaged in the middle there, but it's there. It's in a different position than you see it on the mannequin, but, but it's, um, it's on this uh, support system. And then I did the book. And you know, the book took uh, at, le at least two years, possibly into three. I don't remember exactly. And during that time period, it was intense. Uh, fabulous company to work for. There was no problem, but, but it was just intense work. And so I wasn't <coughs> making any pieces, just a little, tiny bit. So when the book was finished and I returned to working, I don't know, it's like my head just wasn't yet ready to construct. So I did this piece of just dowels. And here you see it on Cora Hardy, who is here today from 
I can't remember which place, Florida and then others. And it's musical, which is an interesting thing we can't see in the image. And then David the, Ingram, who worked for me, got a new bandsaw and he did this, this sort of uh, shape that was uh, attached to the wood base. And it wasn't meant for this piece, but I got this idea that where I wanted to contrast curving lines with the straight lines of the necklace. So when you put the necklace on, this is the way it looks. So that's an, a more recent um, presentation. Exhibition themes, well, gosh, I've, I've exhibited uh, in all sorts of shows all, all this um, career, and I exhibited a lot at um, oh, Mobilia, I'll tell you later. So there was a show years ago where you had to show an Asian influence, and I thought, I went to the library and checked out a book to see what could influence me. That was stupid. Because on my chest of drawers, since I have been a child, lives this doll in this exotic costume, right, with this obi sash. So I did a series of four um, obi takeoff pieces. Um, they're difficult to put on, thinking of takeoff. I shouldn't have used that word. But they are wearable. But you couldn't sit down with the obi sash on. You couldn't get in the subway with it. So mine's not made for riding in a subway either. And this is the fourth one of that series. So, um, and then I show with Helen Drutt, and I'm still working for Helen. And uh, she had a show in Philadelphia that was when they were having a big political convention there. And so she wanted something to do with history and politics, that sort of thing. Of course, I asked, who do you think? Jim. And he gave me a map. I didn't even change the size of it, of the US, and cut out, stitched all these 48 maps. And then we did a, a wooden state that is riveted on for each of the 48 states. So I called Helen about this. I said, I've got these 48 states. And she said, don't you know there are 50? <laughs> <laughs> And I knew. I just hadn't said it yet. <laughs> She's wonderful. And uh, yeah, Alaska and Hawaii are the earrings. And they go, they go on a small painting, so. <laughs> well, Pittsburgh, yeah. So Jim and I were going on sabbatical. He had a great plan. And he said, what do you, what's yours? And I didn't have one. So he said, we would be traveling a lot. He said, uh, how about doing the colors of places? So I did that. And a past student came back, John Plouffe, who's in that wonderful archive, digital archive that's in the exhibition, thanks to Portico's class and Susan Covert over here. Anyway, John said, being smart, he said, well, what are the colors of Pittsburgh? And I said, John, it's all fast food colors. It's nothing but McDonald's <laughs> and... Dairy Queen, I mean, that's it. That's Pittsburgh. And he said, what about the brick streets? Well, I can't even get home without driving on brick, right? The sidewalk in front of our house is brick. And also, we have a fireplace in our kitchen made of old Pittsburgh paving brick. Duh, why didn't I think of that myself? So here's the Pittsburgh brick. And Jamie Oliver hung it. And he didn't know that I only have hung it and seen it horizontally. Mm -hmm. And this smart man up here, he hung it vertically. And I like it better vertically. <laughs> it relates so much better to what it is. And uh, a, chair, a chair show. Well, yeah, I waited a long time to start this. I thought I'd make a small chair for a child. And then I thought, well, I make jewelry. So there's the yellow brick, uh, not yellow brick, but the yellow ladder back chair. Mobilia I used to show it in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Had so many teapot collectors. I mean, we did, I've done so many teapot pieces. So this one is 10 bracelets. I think there are 10 there that fit. You can rotate them on that teapot. And it's in the De Jong Museum out in San Francisco now. And then Mobilia had a book show. So I got all excited about the book show and um, built this form paper wrap, paper mache, I, oh, steel rods. And there are, I think, oh, there are well over 100 pages. I worked a year on the pages. I, I really enjoyed doing them. 
and then it needed a stand, and there it is on the stand. And uh, I didn't want to miss the show. <laughs> I have, I'm bad. <laughs> I didn't want to miss one. <laughs> and so this was my six-week book that got in the show. Uh, it's a takeoff on a flip book. <laughs> so historical references I like to do. Had a solo show a couple years ago in Wales and saw this piece at the British Museum called The Mold Cake dug up in Wales, yes. So, I mean, this refers back to that, you know, your, if, if your pants don't hurt, it's, <laughs> it's, because you couldn't push your arms out wearing this. So that was for me. I knew that was what I wanted to do. So this is my piece. And the best part is that I wasn't finished with the bottom of it when I left for Wales. I mean, I'm all, you know, I just never get it all the way done. So I, they let me paint the bottom in the prep room. And the men who had installed the show, they said, that looks so romantic for me to be painted. I thought, you're kidding me. I'm doing work here. <laughs> but what, the, what happened was they came and they said, do you mind if we bring a, ki a group of children in who are here visiting? They opened the door and they all yelled, Mold Cape, Mold Cape, because everybody in Wales knows of that. Its title is from a hill where it was dug up. But I swear every child grows up knowing all about the Mold Cape. So they recognized mine without even knowing. And then I did the Chopines, and uh, Jim helped me with this because I had an idea, but he told me to think a bit harder. <laughs> and thank goodness he did. So this is a, a reference to the Chopines that were worn, especially in Venice, by women in the 1500s and forward. And it showed that they were very wealthy because they got to be 30 inches high. And they had to have a servant on either side to help them walk. Anything for fashion, right? And then this one for a Helen Drott show on chatelaines. And a chatelaine was a, so, a piece of jewelry that somebody would hang off of a belt. So I did mine a little bigger as an apron to the fashion designer, Chaparelli, with references to her. I think I've got to hurry, but I am nearing the end. And uh, this was a commission uh, for a woman named Catherine. And he wanted me to refer to the Catherine wheel. It's a legend. But supposedly, when St. Catherine was being killed, they used a wheel with spikes on it. But when, they, when it met her body, <laughs> it, went, it broke up and it went flying all over and killed all the people around and not her, so they beheaded her. So, but <laughs> ooh, ooh is right. <laughs> it's a legend. It's not for real. And so fireworks today that come out from the circle are called Catherine wheels. And this is mine. Now, I, you, you can believe, I have five layers of other paint underneath that final version. And so it's, uh, I don't remember this big, maybe 10 or 12 inches across. There's the back with that wheel breaking apart in a very literal way. And that's the, the brooch that spins. And the woman it was made for, at least when she first got it, spins it every day. <laughs> Yay. So tying. Uh, I mentioned that Annie and I tied on this piece, but this piece was inspired, it was for a show. You had to look at a painting and be inspired. So I looked at Amon, um, Amon help me out, Jim. Oh, I can't hear you, so it'll be all right, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and so um, you see the little tubular design. So those are two necklaces, can't stop at one, so there are two, and uh, take off on that. And then this one, uh, reversed, for a show about seduction. My work is not seductive. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been told it repels. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the opposite. So I came up with putting this together as a veil. And the technique is the last thing to talk about, because I consider that the least important. I want the craftsmanship to be good. But there, you can see you know, a piece before it's finished. There's a solder metal, soldered metal rod that runs around this, stitched into the cardboard, 
and I refused to ever buy a glue gun for years because I saw too much glue gun glue on my students' projects and finally broke down. And uh, it was a big help on this one rather than sewing it all in cardboard. And this is the piece as it was finished. This one's at the Victoria and Albert. And too big for their showcases, so it got in a really good spot. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say thank you. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe that you've all come for this. And I am so thrilled and really touched by it. So I thank PSU. Yeah, PSU has been great. It's been a privilege to be here. And I like to say that my life for all these years, well, most of them, and I'll explain that, has been PSU for 50, UPS for 50, <laughs> <laughs> and the best NPR station I've ever heard for the last 29. Yeah. <laughs> and to my family, uh, again, there's Jim, who I think you have figured out by now has given me ideas. He's even ghostwritten things for me, but don't tell. Has edited my own writing, has carried my pieces, carried the projectors, pushed the slides, mm -hmm. taken the slides. It's endless. So, uh, so he's had a third career here. He was an academic and a historian, a teacher, and he ran Marge's career. <laughs> and so this is his his, his, you know, if you know Jim, he's got a wonderful collection of really wild shirts that he wears in the spring and summer. So, so this is a wooden shirt uh, on which you can attach the tie when you don't have it on, or you can wear it. And the tie is flexible. It's, it's canvas and wood. Our son, you know, he is so smart, and he gives his mom the best advice. And so I'm always ready to take it. And so, uh, for Rob, there's a show. Uh, there's a piece in the show called "Boy Named Rob," and when he was born, this is the announcement. It's a photograph by the by the piece. This is the announcement I made, running a safety pin through the red circle I cut out on the blue paper, and this is the piece which references that throughout. I wanted to put it together in a toy-like manner, so that's why there are all those wooden. Um, circles and beads and such. Cloth, because he did wear cloth diapers at that time. <laughs> and then we live in an old blue house, so there's the house. So that's my piece to rock. My gorgeous mother. And uh, I made a silver bracelet she wore every day. So I'm going to use that word patina once again because, man, that had the best patina on it from all that constant wear. And this was a nickel bracelet I made for her, which she wore for dress up. And to my mentor, Professor Alma Eicherman, you know, she would write six to seven page, long page letters of what she had done and all her, her graduate students. So she kept us all together, even though I might not have met who, who all these people were. We knew the names, we knew what they were done. I took it for granted. I'd get these letters twice a year plus. I've got a whole box of her correspondence headed to the Smithsonian. Um, but she, Jim said, well, do you see me getting those letters from Alma? One more thing about Jim and Alma, and, and then I've, I'm almost to the end. You know, when we were graduate students, I worked late hours and got in that habit, which has continued. Jim works the early hours. His car used to be here seven days a week by 5.30. So uh, anyway, did I tell you about the phone not ringing? And he'd put his, he'd pass by the phone and he'd pick it up and he'd say, it hadn't rung, but he'd say, well, Alma, she put in a good day today. <laughs> <laughs> or he'd pass by, even when I was here in Pittsburgh, no phone in my office, so I'd get home and the next morning he'd say, you passed last night because Alma called and you were at school working. <laughs> and then if I wasn't working hard enough, He'd pass by that phone and he'd pick it up. He'd say, Alma, you'd be really disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Alma was incredible. And I can't, I, I think I'm still working for Alma. And this is my tribute piece to her because she's kept all of us together uh, with those letters, with the commonality that we were all studying with the same person. 
And so this is my self-portrait. <laughs> and I made it a, a, a while after doing the um, uh, Dalstick pieces. But I figured everybody would think I had nothing upstairs in my head except <laughs> sticks. <laughs> and, so, and so this is me. And then when I had my retrospective that traveled to museums a few years ago, David expanded on the stick idea. But today, I think, uh, I think looking back, Jim had a quotation under a poster I was in at, on his office door, that lovely one about, you should live each day as if your hair's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did a lot. Maybe not every day, but quite a few days. And so now I've got the hair that looks more like fire. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for coming and being so attentive as I went over time. And I thank you for everything, for being here, you fabulous people. So hats off to you. Thanks. First of all, I should remind people that the show's going to be up a little longer. Oh, so, through Tuesday. Through Tuesday. We'll not take it down until Wednesday. But Sodexo has done the food, so you must want to go. <laughs> and I thank the art department for all of that. So you should go relax with beautiful food. And uh, my God, uh, he brought in orchid plants this morning. Ah, I mean, Marjorie this is on. just uh, heaven on earth. Yeah. <laughs> so go enjoy, and I hope I get to speak to each of you. <laughs> I'll try my best. It's great. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>